Can you just tell me your name and a little bit about yourself real quickly? Um, I'm Steve Beyer. I am a uh, retired professor, a uh, retired lawyer, a retired wilderness guide, a semi-retired peacemaker and community builder. Um, have you seen any progress with the Eagle and Condor prophecy, specifically the coming together of indigenous peoples? Um, yes and no. Um, I have seen a number of attempts, um, especially through um, attempts at integrating um, ayahuasca shamanism and um, uh, the Native American church, the use of peyote. And sometimes those attempts have worked out well, sometimes they haven't. Um, there have been um, some sun dances uh, in South America that have been more or less successful. But I think that there, there are cultural differences um, between North American and South American indigenous people that are yet to be resolved. I'll give you an example. Um, there is a woman named Marie Peruchon, who is an, a, a French anthropologist who studied the Schwar. And the, um, uh, she lived with the Schwar and, in fact, became married to a Schwar shaman and was herself initiated as an Uishin, a, a Schwar shaman. The, the Schwar are one of the few people in the upper Amazon um, where there are many uh, female shamans. And um, she went to a, a meeting of the Native American church they, who wanted to have a, a, a uh, the Shawar Shaman Foundation had put together this meeting of Shawar and uh, shamans and Native American peyote roadmen. Um, and she was having her period. And to the Shawar, this was not a problem, but to the, the roadman of the Native American church, he wanted to kick her out. And so there, in addition, you know, it's very easy to talk about the eagle and the condor, but the symbolic nature of the eagle in North America is very different from the symbolic nature of the condor in South America. And you find, if I remember correctly, it's mostly North American indigenous people who talk about the eagle and the condor because South American people don't see the condor as having the same kind of spiritual significance as the eagle does in, in North America. Um, a friend of mine who is a Native American church road chief went down for a, one of these meetings where they would do ayahuasca and peyote and it wound up, they, they, the organizers in Colombia wound up charging so much money that indigenous Colombians couldn't afford to attend. It was attended primarily by um, European tourists who, as he put it, were there only for the medicine. So it, there, there are things to be worked out. What are some of the ceremonial differences between ayahuasca and peyote, like specifically the chanting differ uh, differences, um, preparation, the setting? Is there really much of a difference? Oh, I think there's a tremendous difference. Um, now, I, I wouldn't put myself forward as an expert on, on peyote ceremonies. I know a little bit. Um, and, of course, there, there can be a lot of variation because there's no central authority for the Native American church any more than there is for Amazonian shamanism. But Native American church ceremonies tend to be very organized and very disciplined. Um, so uh, all kinds of, of rules um, about uh, how you behave, how you, you hold the sacred implements. Um, when you, when they, in the morning, for example, when they pass around the water bucket, um, you have to put the water bucket down and make sure that the handle is pointing toward the altar. Um, and um, I asked one road chief about this. I had gone through, sorry, he had yelled at me a lot because I was doing everything wrong. And um, I said, um, 
why, why are you so strict about this? And he said, we get a lot of people in the, in the Native American church who lead chaotic and disorganized lives. They have problems with alcoholism, with domestic abuse, um, with substance abuse. These are people whose lives are, are not organized properly. And we need to show them that there is a way to live in an orderly and sacred way. And that's what the ceremony does. It shows people that there is a path. There is a right way to do things, and you have to do things in the right way. I thought that was really, really good. Um, there's a lot less of that in, in shamanic ceremonies. Um, I think we have to take into account, at least traditionally, the fact that peyote is a very different kind of sacred plant than ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a hallucinogen. It gives information. It tells you things. Peyote is structurally much closer to MDMA, um, and in my view, is much more of a, an, an intactogen, an empathogen. It, it is a heart-opening sacred plant, and the Native American church meetings are heart-opening meetings. Um, they are designed to build community. People, the song goes around. Everybody takes a turn singing their song. Um, it's, and when the ceremony is over and you've been up all night, and you're tired, and you're hungry, and you're thirsty, and you ache from sitting up all night, and you, um, uh, you just, the sense of community that is built in one of these meetings is, there's a lot of hugging <laughs> goes on. Um, after a Native American church meeting that goes on all night. And um, I think in many ways this is different. The purpose is different. Ayahuasca ceremonies are primarily for healing, although, again, traditionally among indigenous and mestizo people in the upper Amazon, the concept of what is a sickness and what is healing is very different from, from North America. Uh, is the practice of using natural, non-psychoactive plants and herbs for medicinal use still widely used by Native North Americans today, as is the case in the Amazon? I don't know. Um, it's a really good question. I think that there continues to be um, a, a, an important herbalist tradition. Um, I think in both places, it's dying out. Um, and I think in both places the problem is the same. If you, if you ask shamans in, in the upper Amazon um, what their biggest problem is in transmitting their, their knowledge, uh, they will say that there are no apprentices. There's nobody who wants to learn this. And I think the situation is very similar in, in North America. Um, there is very little incentive for young people to apprentice themselves to traditional healers. Um, there are, I was talking, who was I talking with today? About uh, the Navajo Sing. Um, and some of the, the Navajo ceremonies um, that are less practiced than, say, the Blessing Way uh, are dying out because there are not young people who want to undertake uh, the rigors of learning to, to sing these, uh, these chants because uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous commitment and, and for most young Navajo there is no incentive. How would Western society benefit from a periodic shamanic experience assisted by psychedelic plants? I don't know. Um, I would question the assumption that sacred plants necessarily produce the kinds of effects that a particular subculture of North American culture want them to produce. Um, the Shuar are a good example. All the Hivaroan speaking people, the Shuar, the Achuar, the uh, Aguaruna, um, 
were ayahuasca drinking people, and they were also headhunters. Um, I, I, is there a connection? As to <laughs> if, if we brought ayahuasca to North America, would we start collecting human heads? Um, I, I, I don't think that having people drink ayahuasca is going to change culture um, until the Shipiba. Um, I want to, let me try an experiment. I'm going to say a word, and then I want to see if you get a picture in your head, okay? American Indian. Now, I will bet that as soon as I said American Indian, you thought of somebody on a horse with feathers, with a lance, chasing buffalo, right? Pretty much. All right. That is an American Indian, and the reason we have that picture in our head is because basically of Buffalo Bill Cody and his Wild West show, so that the paradigmatic Indian is in fact a relatively short-lived culture of the American Plains, which didn't even come into existence until after the Spanish conquest because they didn't have horses. And, and um, had its cultural efflorescence for a relatively short period of time. Now, I don't want to take the position that you know, the, the Lakota are gone because they're obviously not and they are surviving and thriving in all kinds of ways, but the classical Indian culture is, is now gone. And yet, the Sioux, the Lakota, um, the, uh, the Comanche are, are our picture. That's what's happening with the Shipibo in South America. Uh, because of the gringo tourists wanting to have the sense of the authentic South American indigenous experience, and because of their artwork, which Westerners find very appealing, they have become the Lakota of, they've become the Sioux of South America. And yet, with all of their ayahuasca drinking, they, until at least the 1950s, did had cultural things that we would find very questionable until the, at least the 50s, they performed clitoridectomies on pubescent girls. Um, now, the reasons that they did clitoridectomy is very different than the reasons you see, say, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, but it's still the case, and, and nobody talks about that. So, does, does ayahuasca turn people into clitoridectomists? <laughs> Um, does ayahuasca turn people into headhunters? Um, certainly, I see no cultural evidence that, that um, ayahuasca drinking by itself turns people into peace-loving hippies, hugging each other and singing kumbaya. Do you have any explanations of why ayahuasca is driven by sound? Yes, I can do that one. Um, we live in an in a very visual culture. European culture generally, at least since the 17th century, has been highly oriented toward the visual. Um, so that when we think of hallucinations, when we think of visionary experiences, note the term visionary experiences, we think of the visual, we think of seeing things. Um, but in fact, Ayahuasca is a very potent auditory hallucinogen. Um, and if you read um, indigenous descriptions of the effects of ayahuasca, they talk, Michael Harner used this term, the sound of rushing water. Um, it has lots of auditory effects, uh, and um, most of the Westerners who go down there, I don't know what term to use, Westerners isn't right, Northern is, is, is better, but then you leave out the Australians, so I'm not quite sure foreigners. When foreigners go down there, because we come from this highly visually oriented society, we, um, uh, we tend to ignore the auditory parts of the experience. Um, and let me take a step back. Um, you when you go out of the city, can see something that people in the jungle very rarely see. You can see the horizon. If you live in the jungle, you almost never see the horizon unless you get onto a really wide river 
and that's fairly straight and you can look and see the horizon. Most of the time, you are living in an environment where you do not see more than 15 or 20 yards away under any circumstances. Under those circumstances, the auditory becomes much more important than the visual. Um, and if you look, I, because of my interest in, in hunting and survivalism, I, I went hunting sometimes with the mestizos, and they, I was surprised because I had been taught in North America. They didn't do tracking um, because most of the time the rain washes the tracks away anyway. Um, they, they didn't look for sign the way a North American hunter would look for sign. But they did two things that were striking. First of all, they knew where the animals were. They would go to the places where the animals congregated. And for any huntable species of animal, they would know where to find the animal. This drinking hole, uh, that place over there is where they could normally be found. But even more striking was that they were very, very skilled at making animal sounds and then listening for where they got responses from the animals and going there. Wow. So the auditory, this is a going around a big circle, I'm coming back to your question. The auditory is very, very important in jungle cultures uh, as opposed to the great plains of European, Central Europe, where you see the horizon all the time. So to, um, in the upper Amazon, the auditory effects of ayahuasca are just as important, sometimes even more important than the visual effects. So when you drink ayahuasca and you have auditory hallucinations, you can you hear things and you hear sounds and you hear the sound of rushing water and you hear the sound of rain. And I remember once I was out in the jungle and, and there was a sound of people at a cocktail party, the sort of hubbub of people talking at the cocktail party. There was one time um, uh, I was sitting with a bowl of water for throwing up in, and I heard the sound of a, of a puppy dog coming and lapping up the water. And I'm walking there, no puppy dog, and I look away and hear the sound of the puppy dog. And now we're getting speculative. Um, most of these sounds tend to be described as a kind of white noise, the sound of rushing water, the sound of rain. Um, and just as visually ayahuasca helps us construct visions out of bits and pieces of, of perception, uh, it helps us construct songs out of bits and pieces of auditory hallucinations. And um, part of the process, I think, that helps you do that is hearing somebody else's song that becomes integrated into the auditory process of, of ayahuasca. And so there is this idea that a, a skilled shaman can control the content of your vision through singing. Uh, what was your calling to ayahuasca? Did she find you or did you find her? I stumbled across her. Um, when I was younger, I was, I was really interested in, um, jump, in, in survivalism. I was very interested in wilderness survival. And I got trained in mountain survival and desert survival and, and wilderness survival generally. And it was all very macho and, um, you know, drop me naked in the desert with a knife and I will eat lizards and survive. And, um, as, I, as I study the, the, the survival techniques in, in North and South America, it became clearer and clearer to me that there was a spiritual component in this. Um, that it had to do with being in right relationship with other persons, and by persons I mean not only human persons who live with you, but all the other than human persons that are also part of your extended environment, plants, 
animals, trees, rocks, stars, thunder, are all persons. And part of the ways in which indigenous people live in their environment is to be in right relationship with all of these human and other than human persons. And as I, as I thought about that, I started becoming curious about the ways in which indigenous people maintained right relationships with these other than human, per these spirits, plant spirits, animal spirits. So I tried drinking ayahuasca and I, I attended meetings of a Native American church and I, I tried San Pedro in, in Mesa ceremonies. Um, and I just, um, the experiences with ayahuasca were so intriguing that I, I followed through and continued to try to understand what was, what was going on. Why do you think ayahuasca makes her appearance known in a jaguar or serpent form? I don't think she does. I think that is a, um, a uh, Western myth. And as a matter of fact, um, I, in it, I'll plug my book in a minute, but in my book, <laughs> I have a whole section on this whole mythology of, uh, um, uh, I think it was Andrew Weil who was told by somebody that when, when Eskimos drink ayahuasca, they see jaguars and they've never heard of jaguars before. Come on. Um, this of course, Eskimos know what jaguars are. They get books and magazines and movies just like everybody else in the whole world. Um, and the same thing, this idea that, you know, um, primitive people drink ayahuasca and, and know things that they couldn't possibly know um, is just silly. Um, if you expect to see jaguars and serpents, you may very well see jaguars and serpents. But um, I don't think ayahuasca appears that way. Ayahuasca um, has appeared to me well, the plant spirits have all appeared to me as women, often beautiful women. And I told my daughter this. I said, you know, the plant spirits all appear to me as beautiful women. She said, well, duh, you're a god. <laughs> so I, um, um, ayahuasca may appear that way to people. Um, there is certainly a whole... Um, mythological, um, cosmological view of uh, among indigenous people in the upper Amazon about jaguars and uh, and uh, snakes because they are ultimate predators. There are connections between shamans and jaguars because they are both predators. Um, there's a there's a whole mythological cosmological complex among many indigenous people in the upper Amazon that, that link shamans with, with snakes. Uh, and uh, when you have, when you drink ayahuasca, before you enter the realm of the spirits, there are visual effects and, and exploding galaxies and pinwheels and Greek key patterns and sometimes serpent-like form, so I can see why people do that. Uh, what book was that? Singing to the Planet? Oh, you bet. Um, everybody, rush out in a shopping frenzy and buy my book, um, Singing to the Plants, a, uh, a guide to mestizo shamanism in the upper Amazon. And um, if, if you are so eager to read my book, you cannot wait. It's available on Kindle, and you can download it in a matter of seconds. Um, and I hope that whoever goes out and buys my book enjoys it. What would your advice be to future generations regarding psychedelics? <laughs> what would I tell my grandchildren about psychedelics? Um, I don't know. Um, what would I tell them about food? What would I tell them about sex? What would I tell them about anything that has both risks and benefits? Um, I guess I would say um, make good decisions.